Hi, Barry here. This is a video on how to use the Phantom VO 4K. I love this camera. It's incredibly easy to use. Um, and hopefully at the end of this video, you're gonna understand how to set the camera up, how to shoot the clips, how to partition the media, and then how to play back the clips and transfer them to, um, uh, to, to the cards. Uh, there will be a supplementary video on how to use the PCU2 Plus wireless controller. Okay, so the first question is, how do you power it? How do you switch it on? Right, so I have here two mini V-Lock 98s uh, on a quick plate, and I have a four pin Canon output. The first secret is that there is no one off switch on this particular camera. To switch it on, you plug your four pin Canon directly into the Canon, into the power input. And then after about 90 seconds, the camera will um, power itself back on. Just for ease of this particular video, I'm not going to be using batteries. I'm going to be plugging it into the AC adapter. Okay, so we have our main power input here, and this powers the breakout box, which is this device here. It is incredibly important that these two cables are plugged in order to distribute power from the breakout box into the camera, and then, then the control out from the camera into the, um, the, the camera uh, serial port, without which the camera simply won't work and you'll be really confused. So there are only three buttons that you really need to know in order to use this camera. This is the record button. This is the playback button. And under here, there is a small menu uh, rotating knob, and this is the menu button. With those, three, um, with those three buttons and knobs, you can basically control everything about the camera. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to put the camera into live mode. To do that, we press the control button here, the record button here, and we hold it for three seconds. And you can see the red circle appears on the top left-hand screen of the monitor. And it has number one because this is partition one. And because you can see a red circle, it means you're recording. Okay, so we're going to have an event, after which we're going to press the record button to show you how easy it is to use. Here we have an event. And having done this, what I now do is I press the, the playback button, and you can immediately see the clip that's here. And now we're in playback mode, and you can see that I have these two buttons either side. These are the scrubbing buttons, which allow me to scrub all the way through. So if I press and, and scrub through, you can see that one whole clip of 72 gigs is incredibly long. In fact, this is 277 frames, uh, which is almost four minutes. So you can see we've got a very nice effect here. All right, so we're gonna have we're going to create the start point and we're going to press the menu button. We're going to choose an end point because we want to, we don't want to transfer the entire clip. We just want to transfer the most useful. We're going to press play here and now you can see everything that's, that's happening and we can actually scrub through all the way till the end. Again, press the menu button, choose an out point and we're still saving 3000 frames. We're just saving 383 frames. This is about 15 seconds. As soon as I press the save 383 frames, you'll see on the top right-hand side that um, you can see the countdown of how we are saving. Now everything is being transferred to the uh, onboard card right here. So um, nothing more to do. That really is as simple as the camera is. But the big problem is, of course, you now can't use the camera as you are recording, as you're transferring the media. So for that reason, I much prefer a smart workflow which involves partitioning your whole of your super fast memory into multiple partitions because then each particular partition acts like a separate memory store. And I'm gonna show you how to do exactly that. So what we wanna do is we're gonna go back into record mode and press the menu button. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna go all the way to the very, very 
final screen, and we're going to change the memory partitions now, and we're going to choose three partitions. I think three partitions is perfect because it allows us to take uh, one, one partition and then a, uh, one take, then a second take, and then whilst we're trimming the first and second takes and doing a transfer, we are still recording on the third partition, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate. Right, so if I press the playback button now, you're immediately going to see that we now have three um, Cine RAMs, so three independent partitions. Remember, each of these can be recording, can be trimming, can be transferring or recording all at the same time. And we're going to press and hold the record button again for three seconds. And as soon as we do that, you'll see the uh, red circle start and it has a one. That's really important because we're now recording on partition one. Okay, so here we're going to take the first take and then press the record button. We've just triggered, now we're on our second trigger. Again, second event, after which we press the trigger button again. If I press the playback button, you'll immediately see that we have two different partitions, both of which have media on them. If I use the scrubbing buttons now, you'll immediately be able to see if I press and use my menu button in order to select RAM 1 and play, we can see at a glance, we've got our, our shot already done. We say, okay, you know what, this is quite a good take, but it's not quite good enough. We're not going to like this one. So let's stop with that one. We'll just press the playback button one more time, choose the second round clip, choose play again, and again I've got the same, I can do exactly the same thing. So everything is, uh, and do you know what, I prefer this one. So let's go and choose our start point. We'll choose this as our end point, and then we'll go all the way forward. We'll get lots of this lovely splash. I'm going to choose this as my out point. I'm not being too careful here. 714 frames. This is an awful lot. This is about 30 seconds. You wouldn't normally save this much. Just for the sake of this um, exercise, I'm going to do that. And you can see on the top right-hand side how much time it's going to take and it's st steadily ticking by. But if I immediately press my live button, you'll see that I'm actually still recording on my third partition. But on the top right hand side, it can tell me when I can use my card. So I'm now all ready for my third take. Right, so I'm all ready to go. I'm gonna throw some dye in here. Ah, oh, nice, pressing the record button. I think I might have just missed that actually. So I can press the playback button again and then use my menu to go here, and you can immediately see, there it is, all, all, all ready. Now, the fact that I've missed it is not really an issue. The, the, the important thing here is that I've done all of that at the same time that it was actually still transferring uh, my clip. I think this is really important because in life, I like to work smart rather than working hard. So this means that you're not having to transfer everything on your partition onto a slower medium than you might otherwise like. Um, but it gives you the capability to have more than one bite of the cherry. The other thing is also important to mention that this specific camera, uh, we've had all of our phantoms installed with 10 gigabit ethernet ports. And that means that if you have a super fast PC and a DIT on location, you will be able to pull the data off the camera and control the camera uh, from a PC much faster than you could do, say, if you had um, a Phantom Flex 4K, which you would have to go through the full rigmarole of going from internal um, storage onto Cinemag and from Cinemag separately onto hard drive. This would allow you to go directly from the camera onto uh, your, your hard drive of your, of your PC. Okay, so now I'm going to talk you through the menu. So if we press the record button and I go into the menu, this will open all of the menus. And it's probably a good idea to explain what all of these different things are. So I can scroll all the way through or I can press and I can scroll through each screen independently to go and have a look. So the first one is you have up to a thousand frames per second. And this does depend very much on the resolution that you're working. 
So if I was going to be working at 4K rather than UHD, it only gives me up to 938 frames per second. If I was working instead at 2K, then I can actually ramp this all the way up to um, 1492 frames per second. So you have all of these options available to you. And once you've set all of these, uh, or all of these up, for example, what I can do is I can go to uh, set up here and I can actually save them to a separate setting. And this is actually a very useful function to be able to do, which I frequently use. It is very important with a camera like this to be frequently black balancing. And whenever you change any of the settings, what I always like to do is to recommend to people that they do black balance. So when you're in the record mode, again, which you just press the, the record button, you press and hold the black balance for a couple of seconds, and then it will perform a black balance that easy. Okay. So I have a white balance capability, which we can actually set up for whatever, uh, however, the color temperature, the light that you're using. This is very important. Where do you trigger? So if I trigger at the beginning, this means that as soon as I press the button and start to record, it's going to record from here onwards. Now it's recording. As opposed to, yeah, so now it's recording. As opposed to what I like to do, which is to set up the trigger right at the end. And with the trigger at the end, then when I'm in record mode and I'm recording, all I have to do at some point is just trigger and it stops recording, which I think is the smart way of doing it. If indeed you want to, you can actually have some combination so it records a little bit before and a little bit after. It's entirely your choice. Next, you have your video system. Sometimes when you're resetting, it will automatically put it into 30 frames per second. Very important to work at 25 frames per second. And if you are going to be at 25 frames per second, it's important to, let's say if I change it now to 30 frames per second, you have to say confirm. If you don't say confirm, the next time you look at the menu, it will have switched back to 25 too. So I made that mistake as well, so it's just worth, worth mentioning. I can record anamorphic. Right, I'm in rolling shutter. This particular camera, the VO4K, can record in either rolling shutter or global shutter. And to change it, you just have to um, go into global shutter. I'm going to do this, and as soon as I press this button, something really strange is going to happen, all right? And it's very important to mention that this is completely normal, okay? If you're gonna go on location, and as soon as the screen fills up with the letters that you're about to see, it's very easy to panic and swear expletives with the director and the client looking at me saying, is the camera supposed to do this? I've actually spoken to Vision Research. They've assured me this is completely normal. Unbelievably, even though we're on uh, further uh, firmware releases, they still haven't changed it. And after about 90 seconds or so, uh, this will um, just come back to life. Benefits of a global shutter over a rolling shutter, supposedly at a particular snippet in time, you're not gonna see any jello, but I've actually never seen any jello with this specific camera in any case. Um, you do have a little bit more sensitivity, uh, I understand, with uh, rolling shutter as opposed to global shutter. Okay, so down here we have user IP. This is if you're gonna use the 10 gig ethernet. And the very final one, with color space, this is only for your output, okay? And it is worth mentioning that this HD SDI output, which is here, um, is HD. So the camera's going to record 4K raw all the time, but you can actually change whether you want to actually see a rec or a log output. It's entirely up to you. Okay, and having changed this, if I did want to repartition my memory partitions, I can do that. And you'll probably notice, having done this and go all the way back, it has already automatically put this into 1080 30p, so it will be very important for you to put this back into 25p mode and say confirm. Okay, so that really is pretty much all you need to know about the Phantom VO 4K. A couple of things actually worth mentioning. Um, this camera, it works extremely hard when it's working and in very hot environments, it is possible 
uh, for the camera to overheat. And if it overheats, it starts to do strange things. You might see some patterning on the screen. If you do start to see patterning on the screen, on the background, for whatever reason, then change from global shutter to a rolling shutter and back again, and, uh, and that ought to fix it. If you're seeing strange things and the camera is overheating, unplug it, leave it for a minute, and then replug it back in. It has been extremely reliable, so uh, you know you don't really need to worry too much about reliability. You have to transfer your media from the internal super fast storage onto CFast cards. And once it's on the CFast cards, the camera itself has no ability to play it back. So that, that is worthy of consideration. We find that uh, three times 256 gig uh, CFast cards is enough for even the most memory hungry of clients. Other than that, make sure that you're properly set up. You set up 25p, you've done a test, you're comfortable with all of your settings, um, save your settings, uh, rehearse them, and uh, you won't have any problems. Phantom VO 4K, hire it from VMI.